Awesome. Hey guys, uh, welcome back to chapter five. Um, so in the last lecture, we went over the fourth chapter, which is over nonverbal messages. So now we're going to go over listening and responding. So getting into it, we're going to talk about how much of your time um, is spent listening. What is listening? Is listening a problem? The barriers to listening? How should one listen and respond? effectively. So now we're on the little green um, pyramid. So we're on the fourth principle and the next chapter will be the um, will be the last core principle that we'll have to learn for class. Um, and then after we finish the adaptation, um, we will have our like first major assignment seen in the diversity activity and the diversity paper. Um, and we'll kind of go more into detail about that later as well. So how much of your time is spent listening? So 11% is writing. 17% is reading, 17% is speaking, and 55% is listening. So we go throughout our days for the most part listening. Obviously there's um, exceptions here and there, but for the most part, we spend the majority of our time listening. So what is listening? Obviously you've probably heard, um, Usually this is a thing I feel like parents usually say, like, you're hearing me, but you're not listening to me. So hearing is the literal physical aspect of audio transferring into the ear and then transferring into sound waves that we can recognize as language, um, as noise and language. So some people, for example, this is like where um, deaf or hard of hearing people kind of come into play to where like they can listen, but not, they can't always hear um, and vice versa. Versus listening is more so the active engagement with others in reference to, it's the, the physiological aspect of listening. Um, versus just the physical ability to be able to hear. And so there's four different types of listening. There's a relational listener. So that's gonna be someone <clears throat> who listens for emotions, feelings. Those are gonna be kind of their keyword um, aspects, you know. These are gonna be the people who focus on like how, well, how are you feeling? And how does that make you feel? Um, analytical listener are gonna be listeners who, so an ana analytical listener is gonna be listening for the entirety of the message. The message. This is gonna be the person who is gonna to wanna to hear the full story before making a decision or before giving advice. This is, this is um, the, the focus on hearing out the full argument and that may include um, from one person or just in general, um, this is usually the type of listening style that is ideal in a lectured style class. This is gonna be someone who listens the entire time and is constantly making sure to um, keep track of details. Critical listener is gonna be, it seems similar to the analytical, but this is critical in terms of, is the person, critical listeners are always gonna be listening. I hate to say for like what's wrong, but this is gonna be more so about um, say a car salesman is trying to trick you into buying a rundown car, um, for a low price and so the critical listener is going to be listening for those little hiccups um, that lead the car salesman in, into um, showing his cards um, 
the book also goes more into detail about these and you'll also be doing an activity. So I would encourage you to make sure that you are uh, fully able to understand the four different styles of listening. Um, but critical is gonna be is gonna be the person who is looking for mistakes within the person they're listening to. And that doesn't necessarily mean in a bad or um, cynical way. It just means they are always, they're, they're the conspiracy theorists. There it is. They're always um, listening for something that, that may be awry or a bit different. Um, Task-oriented listeners, those are going to be people who are only focused on the um, the objective at hand. They want they want the information that has to do with what they're doing, and they want to handle that and then go home. They don't want to handle feelings. They don't want to talk about. They don't want to listen to the whole story like the analytical listener. They don't want to worry about what's right and what's wrong like the critical listener. The task-oriented listener is going to be the one who let's do it in the least amount of time, energy, uh, and be as efficient as possible. And, and to, to focus at, on the task at hand versus like the, re the relational listener is always looking out for those feelings and those um, emotional cues. Cool. So I hope that kind of helped an understanding. I used to um, add a bunch of like little pictures from the office and we'd go through and like pick out who would be who and like, you know, Pam would be a relational listener. Um, Stanley would be task oriented. Critical would be um, like Jim. And then analytical would be like Dwight. Yeah, yeah, that was fun to do. Um, so here is a little practice question that we're gonna go through together. So Robert was a blank listener because he wanted to receive accurate information that he could use in the future. So I'm gonna give you guys some time to kind of think through it and work through it digitally. And as we go through, obviously it's not gonna be relational. And obviously it's not going to be analytical. So we're left with critical or task oriented. Um, and where you can draw emphasis is you can see receive accurate information. And so that goes back to critical listening. If it had said um, accurate information that he wanted to use to complete the assignment, um, it would have been task oriented, but because it's just about receiving accurate information, it's going to be critical. So going back to what is listening, it's a five step process. Um, they kind of made like a weird, I guess you could say acronym of SUAR. I wouldn't <laughs> recommend trying to remember it like that. This also kind of goes back to um, our perception chapter as well, because it's a process of selecting, attending, understanding, remembering, and responding. So I'm gonna go over this a little bit more in detail this time, because um, some people were having trouble with it. So selecting, is going to be the noticing of information. Attending is responding to that information. So if you guys remember in the chapter two quiz, they talk about um, what would be, what is um, something to do about, you notice your professor, um, like what would selecting and attending be? And the answer was about, um, you see your professor walk in and you put your phone away. So attending is basically not only recognizing the information, but responding kind of to it um, in, in the sense of perception. Um, in this case, attending also refers to the, the 
active engagement of the selection process. Understanding is obviously being able to grasp a comprehensive um, understanding of whatever the message is. Remembering is being able to remember details um, and remembering what the message was. Responding um, obviously is responding, but I would also I would also argue that not all responses are adequate responses. You know, um, every response, every effective response is going to be appropriate, um, both in the tone and message. So is listening a problem? Researchers have identified listening a group Listening problems could be a predictor of conflict um, in general. So usually um, when you're having a fight with someone, uh, one could argue that listening may have been either a direct um, reason for the conflict or it could have been an indirect reason. So for example, um, miscommunication. I would consider miscommunication as a listening problem because you're, you, whether it's, regardless of where the disconnect is coming from, the miscommunication is a result of a listening problem that could have gotten so, <laughs> gotten so uh, taken out of hand and it's just kind of um, consistent in that case. So most people remember only about 25 of what they've heard in the past two days um, after listening to a lecture or presentation. So in one, one ear and out the other, I hope you guys are a little, little bit more um, memorable of what I have been saying. Um, but it basically just goes to show that unless, unless in this case, students are more active with their listening, they're going to have a harder time recalling the information, you know, so if, um, I'm sure, actually, I'm not too sure because this is a first semester for a lot of my students this uh, semester, but usually there are some classes that you're going, going to engage with a bit more. Um, and because of that engagement, you're able to remember things in the class and you'll do better, which is why teachers always, um, at least from what I've been taught, teachers always strive to engage students in class and to make sure that they're involved and are participating in one way or another because if not, people can kind of wander in their own minds if they are not actively engaged in class. So the barriers to listening, they're self barriers. Um, so basically focus, emotional noise, criticism. Um, this could be for yourself or the person speaking. Um, but basically these, these are any internal issues that prevent you from being able to listen adequately. Information processing uh, barriers, and these are going to have to do with um, issues regarding the information. So this has to do with the processing rate. You know, if, you, if, too if you're getting too much information all at once, you're just gonna become overloaded, just like they talk about in the next one. Um, and basically, you know, you're, you have to give your brain time and space in order to digest information. Otherwise, it's just regurgitation. Um, cultural differences, attention shift. So these are just, these are any issues that prevent you from obtaining the information at hand. Context barriers, this has to do with time and place. Um, you know, if you're trying to, if you're at a concert and you're trying to listen to the, to the music, but you'll, you 
forgot to buy a ticket, so you're outside the stadium listening, that's going to be a physical barrier that keeps you from being able to listen to the concert. So what does effective listening look like? Stop, look, and listen. Those are our three recommendations. So stop turning off competing messages, internal noise, and decenter. This is gonna be, you know, the shift. Um, you know, some people really say that they can multitask well, and I'm not gonna argue that they can't, but I would also argue, argue that um, in multitasking, you have to shift your full attention away from one thing and kind of break it into um, other things because we have we have finite attention. No one's attention span is infinite. <laughs> so moving on to look, this is going to be looking for nonverbal cues, meta messages. Um, basically, use your nonverbal communication to communication to regulate. The conversation. Um, this is the active listening part. You know, if you're if you're telling a story to your friend and they're sitting there like this, they're not going to want to keep talking to you, um, or vice versa. When someone is engaging like that, versus usually when effective listening has to do with a lot of nonverbal cues, regulating the conversation to continue, eye contact. Um, Etc. So next, you'll listen. This is going to be um, in the steps of identifying your goal, summarizing the details of the message, practice listening to difficult material, um, working to overcome listening barriers, don't interrupt, engage in active listening, and we will also kind of go more into detail about this later on when talking about pugs. Um, because they give a model that helps um, with conflict, but basically, um, you know, a good way to show that you're listening, um, both from personal experience and from the text. Um, I think people, because um, I tend to incorporate this, this habit of, um, when you're speaking with someone and you know they're talking about something in their life and usually they're venting whether it's a friend family member a roommate a really good way to kind of make them feel better instead of um you know because we never want to one-up someone with our troubles even though we may intend to kind of be like look i'm struggling too it can come across as being very very um in the sense of one-upping their problems and a good way to resolve that is to not even talk about it at that moment. Sometimes you can, but you don't have to. Instead, I really offer and suggest that um, to not even talk about yourself. And if someone is venting to you, basically just re, not regurgitate, but just rephrase what they're saying to you. Take what they're saying to you, listen to it, and basically tell it back and be like, wow, it really sucks that blah, 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 blah happened, you know? Um, and I personally find that this tactic works a lot better than being like, oh, I totally get you, you know, I had to go through blah, 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 because then it just becomes trauma bonding at best and one-upping at worst. And so in order to prevent either of those, um, you know, you can show your empathy by listening and responding with their uh, story. So responding with em uh, empathy um, has to do with understanding your partner's feelings. This is about asking the appropriate questions. Like I said, you can't just, um, if your friend told you your, their dog died, you wouldn't sit there and be like, oh man, I had a dog that died once, that sucked, or you wouldn't um, say, so are you going to get a new one soon? You know, those are just kind of things that aren't appropriate for the situation. Like I mentioned earlier, paraphrase the content, paraphrase the emotions that um, may be being displayed or discussed, um, be descriptive, timely, 
brief and useful. Um, another suggestion is sometimes, sometimes it's important to, um, to sit in silence with uncomfortableness. Um, the text also kind of discusses this in order to, you know, normalize the silence that kind of comes along with awkward and difficult conversations is by sitting there and experiencing it. And, um, you know, I think we need to learn how to be, um, we as people need to learn how to be more appreciative of that silence. So moving on, which statement illustrates the attention stage of listening? So is it recalling what your professor was discussing, sorting through the various sounds you hear in the teaching theater, confirming understanding of your professor's lecture by nodding your head in class, um, focusing on the professor's verbal and nonverbal messages during the lecture rather than the students talking behind you. In this attention stage, um, obviously it's not going to be understanding and it's not going to be recalling. So we're left with sorting through various sounds and focusing on the professor's verbal and nonverbal messages during the lecture rather than the students talking behind you. So, um, as I mentioned before with the, the, with the quiz earlier, oof, sorry, brain fart. Um, but a lot of people had troubles and thought it was B, but it actually would be D because you are making an active um, change in reference to the sound that's happening around them. So instead of just sorting through the sounds, they are, folk, they are choosing to focus on the professor, if that kind of helps um, with people who had quite, who had problems with that question. So today we went over how much of your time is spent listening, what is listening, the four listening styles, um, problems that can happen if you don't listen, the barriers of listening and respond, listening and responding with empathy and effectively. So thanks for watching this. I hope you guys have a good day and the light's a little brighter so you, my lovely bathroom demon isn't here to say goodbye today, but I am, so goodbye.